Hey everybody, it's Brian Reisman, host of Side Jams. This is episode number 57, featuring Buzz Osborne from the Melvins. This is the second video podcast. I hope you enjoyed. If you like what you see in here, click on that subscribe button down below because there are more episodes coming. Now, the Melvins are a very influential band on a lot of people in the metal and grunge world. They have a new two-disc acoustic set called Five Like a Dog in which they rework a lot of songs in their catalog, 54 in total, I believe. Now, this is not the sensitive James Taylor singer-songwriter version of the Melvins. They're still dark and brooding and moody and at times aggressive. Now, when Buzz is not on stage or in the studio making noise and making music, he loves photography, golfing, and comic books. And we're going to get into all of those things right now. Uh, thank you for taking the time to chat. Thank you. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm enjoying the five-legged dog. You couldn't just do one acoustic disc. You had to, you had to do four albums. And mm -hmm. I'm new to the Mel Melvin's universe, but it's very obvious to me that, like, you didn't want to do, we're going to do a soft kind of uh, sensitive interpretation of material. We're just going to see how heavy we can get. <laughs> Still in an acoustic yeah. format, you know? Yeah. I mean, uh, um a long time ago, I got turned on to this record, probably 40 years ago, mm -hmm. by a, a live record that Pete Townsend was a part of, the guitar player from The Who. Yeah, yeah. He did um, three songs. He did, uh, on acoustic, he did Won't Get Fooled Again, Pinball Wizard, and Drown. Mm. And it was then, because I was such a big fan of them, I got that record and I listened to that. Acoustic, his acoustic versions, and they were just as powerful as the band would have been. And I realized that the songs are good no matter what no matter how you do it. And I never lost that idea through um, this record. And I did two solo acoustic records with that in mind and always wanted to, but him and uh, probably Pete Townsend and Bob Dylan mm -hmm. solo acoustic, especially the early 60s stuff or the mid 60s stuff, like a, um, it's all right, mom, only bleeding, just show how heavy you can do, or a lot of blues artists as well. How heavy you can do stuff like that. And uh, it doesn't really make much difference if the songs are good. So I thought out of all of our catalog, there's a lot of songs that we could probably do like that and make it work. And the guys I play with are really good musicians. And yeah, yeah. You just let them do their job. Well, I think yeah. the interesting thing is that it's you. I mean, you've mentioned that you've recorded. You started writing a lot of these songs on acoustic guitar. Always have. Yeah. Acoustic yeah. and, and uh, uh, electric guitar played acoustically. Yeah. But I mean, I think that's and that's the key to good music is is coming up with something that will, you know, that'll work in different formats. I mean, obviously, it's interesting. I remember years, I think there's someone on YouTube who commented, you know, back in the late 90s, someone said we should have a joke, we should have a Melvin's acoustic record, and then it only took 25 years. And then I remember in the early to mid 90s, one critic said, what we really want to hear is a Motorhead unplugged album. Um, I mean, you guys both have old school influences. Your Amoeba video where you and, and the guys, you know, and Dale, you, go, you go and you show everything that you bought. You guys are, are, are old school. I mean, you like newer well, yeah, stuff. Yeah, as well as new school. Yeah. I mean, but, uh, I like about as many new bands as I ever did, which is not many. Yeah. yeah, but you appreciate um, things like the Rolling Stones and you're not afraid to say that, whereas like some no, fans no, no. might be like, oh, whatever. You're like, no, really, dude, it's good. I'm not an ageist when it comes to music. You know, it's yeah. either good or bad. Um, when I was in high school, um, bands like the Stones and Hendrix and The Who mm -hmm. were not of my generation, just like Pete Townsend said, you know, but uh, uh, I loved it nonetheless. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's always think it's silly when um, people will write off, you know, like young people. They just don't listen to this. It's like, that's just not true. Not all young people are that stupid. A lot of them are, you know? So now, you know, obviously with side jams, I, I talk about, I talk about the music being, I also talk about people's passions, their outside hobbies. Yeah. And um, Monica was telling me you're a big, you're a big golfer. Yeah. I love playing golf. I also love uh, photography. Oh, right on. Both. Yeah. That's a popular yeah. one too. I mean, like uh, what attracted you to the sport? Um, some guys that I knew were playing golf um rock and rollers mm -hmm. people um more on the hipster level um not people i hung out with a lot but i knew them enough to go right. when they asked me um do you want to go try playing golf i was like oh okay that sounds fun i think i played it once or twice in high school when i was drunk and then i played with this um friend of mine who had given me this ancient set of clubs that looked like they came over on the mayflower you know? <laughs> and um um, so I had those clubs just gathering dust in the garage and, uh, um, these guys asked me and I said, okay. And I went to this little tiny course. It's not too far from where I live in LA. And, uh, it's like a par three course, nine holes. Right. And I played with them and I was like, you know, this is kind of fun. And, um, so then I continued playing there 
And uh, um, within a couple of weeks, I was playing way better than they were. And I was looking at a lot of stuff on YouTube about how to, how to do it. And um, what I realized was that this was not going to be an easy thing to do right. at all. And I was up for the challenge as far as that's concerned. So within a couple of weeks, I was playing way better than they were. And within a couple of months, <laughs> all cool. of them had quit playing, except for one guy who I still like 15 years later, still play with once in a while, who is about the same level he was when we started. Because he just never took it seriously. So know? so were they were they just they just were that into it? Were they discouraged by your mastery of the sport so early? <laughs> well, <laughs> It's, it's by degrees. It's like, I, I didn't take much to be better than them, yeah. you know, uh, but it's not easy. And so, you know, within a couple of months, people just, if they don't get good at it right away, it's sort of like guitar playing. Yeah. People, they, if they don't get good at it within the first couple of months, they just put the guitar down. And most people just put the guitar down at the end of it. And they may yeah. play, fuck around a little bit, but in order to get good at anything that's as hard as guitar playing or, or uh, um, um, playing golf, you have to put a lot of time in it. There's just no way. So I view golf as a, a massive hobby of mine Sure. that I'm super into. It, it, and, and as a musician who are people of the great indoors, generally speaking, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's a great thing for me to do. It gets me outside on a big course. It's about a four or five mile walk. It's uh, basically in a nice park to some degree. And uh, it gets me out of my head and into this thing obsessively sure that uh takes me completely into a whole new world that i can put my uh intense never stopping brain uh towards you know and and at this point um i'm like a single digit handicap so as far as golf is concerned which is difficult to do i don't know how much you know about golf a little, a little bit. I was looking, uh, re revisiting a lot of the terminology. You know, I was always one of those guys who did goofy golf, you know, <laughs> miniature oh, yeah. golf, which probably drives yeah. real golfers up a wall. I know it's, 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 it's fun to some degree. I mean, I don't know that I would pursue it. Golf is hard enough as it is. Oh yeah. No. It work. I mean, when I was a um, kid, when I was a kid, I did little league. I did baseball three yeah. summers in a row. I did soccer one semester in high school, but I didn't like constantly being kicked in the shins. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> You know, I'd, I I would play tennis or volleyball, stuff like that um, as I got older. But then again, as a writer, it's like what you're talking about musicians. I became like that guy that, uh, you know, does a lot of stuff indoors. You go to screenings, you go to shows during quarantine. Yeah. I, I was able to adjust pretty well for the first probably throughout 2020. Then it started to get weird even for me. Um, did you did you golf at all during actually during the, golf through the whole thing? As soon as I opened the courses up back in L.A., I never stopped. I'm usually going on tour doing 80 to 120 shows a year. Yeah. And so during that time, I don't golf at all. And this time I didn't have that. So I'm playing the best golf I've ever played by far, you know, as far as, as far as like my game goes. Yeah. And now I'm at a level where I play in tournaments and all kinds of things like that with a bunch of squares, you know, people, <laughs> people who are not from the music world at all. And I've made lots of friends, friends in the golf world that have nothing to do with music at all. And we have, what we have in common is an intense love of golf. And people, they have this idea that, oh, it's, it's this country club assholes. And it's like, okay, if I'm doing, do, do I look like a country club asshole or that I want to yeah. be a country club asshole or that I could mix easily with these people? I hate them every bit as much as anyone does outside of that. I want nothing to do with them. The only thing that's good about a country club is their golf courses, but the people that are there and the vibe, I want nothing to do with. Yeah, yeah. I'm a public course, muni course guy, and I will live that. I'll be fine with that the rest of my life. I, I have no interest in rubbing elbows with those fucking jerks, and um, nor do I want to try to pursue that in any way. So I, people need to understand that. Um, golf is a single person sport. It's like you win or lose as a result of your own ability, not a team sport. Right, right. And you have to win. That means you have to finish. It's, it's not like you can run the clock out on this or throw a dice and it happens to come up all sixes or whatever. You win. Wow. You won. No, you have to finish. It doesn't matter if you're having the round of your life by hole 17. If you don't finish hole 18 under those circumstances, then that doesn't really make any difference. It's sort of like baseball or tennis. Tennis is a team sport. But baseball, you have to win. You didn't lose because you didn't have the same opportunity as the other team. 
yeah, yeah. you lost because you you just couldn't do it golf you lost because you couldn't do it not because you didn't have an opportunity Be, uh, tennis you lose because you didn't you know you had exact opportunities as the other guy did and it didn't work out now I, that's the kind of that's the kind of thing I, i've always loved sports what i didn't like was the people who played sports you know, I say and that so, too. It's like I, I sports culture kind of turned me off to a lot of sports. Like I'm not obsessively yeah. watching sports. It's funny that my girlfriend will say, yeah, we don't watch sports together, but except when we go to like a bar or restaurant, we're sitting at the bar and then you start oh, watching yeah. football on TV and you can't, it's like, it's funny. Cause I, I don't pay attention, but then when, when, when the game is there, I start watching it, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah well, no, baseball's at one. I like the non-clock sports personally, like baseball. Yeah. yeah. That I can watch, but it's clock sports. I don't like the clock as a weapon. I don't like it as a strategy. Oh, that's interesting. It bothers me. It's and golf, like, of course, they're, well, the only clock you have is the people behind you waiting for you to take your shot. <laughs> yeah. Right? And so, you know, you, there's, there's rules about that too. Yeah. Like in a place where I play tournaments, you have to, you, your, your group has to finish within 20 minutes of the group ahead of you or you get penalized. Oh, that's interesting. You know, so you have to, you have to keep, and uh, just basic ethics on a golf course. You should keep, you should try to stay one stroke ahead of the group behind you and one stroke behind the group ahead of you. That's what you should try to do. You should be aware of that. I'm often mystified by people on a golf course who are or even driving, who are not aware of anything that's going on around them. Mm. And I often think, what sort of parents did you have? You know? <laughs> <laughs> totally they should have been unaware. thinking about your future in golf. <laughs> yeah, while driving to the golf course, you're totally unaware of what's going on. While you're on the golf course, you're totally unaware of what's going on. It, it's, it's fascinating to me that you can be that. It's, it's my world and everyone else is just, is just, uh, uh, I don't care about. Yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's, just, it's unbelievable. I'm never like that. When I'm on the course, I have good course course ethics and watch out. Yeah. And I want to play the sport in a way that is as high a level as I can. You know, obviously, I'm not anywhere near pro, but right. to get to a single digit handicap is difficult for for any golfer. Any golfer that could shoot under 100 is doing much better than most of them. And if you can shoot in the 80s. You're doing way better than most of them. If you can shoot a lot of rounds in the 70s, you're doing tremendously better. But you're still not on a pro level. What's know? the best uh, score you've ever gotten on a course? 74. 74. On a 72 course. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. Two over, two well, now, when, did, when, when did you start playing tournaments and which tournaments have you played? I played tournaments in, a, uh, in Los Angeles mm -hmm. in like a golf club. that has three or three or 400 guys in it. And okay. the tournaments are usually 70 to 120 guys. And so you play to your handicap. And uh, the last one I played in, I got second. So nice. Not too bad. Not too bad. So um, I like, and you're playing PGA rules. It's not slosh golf or, you know, mulligans or, you know, do overs. It's none of that. You're playing just the same rules as Tiger Woods would play in a tournament. And, and so to go out there and, and do it on that level and, and uh, happily place in, in the top three, which I've done lots and lots of times, not every time, but lots and lots of times is far more than I could have imagined I would have been able to do when I first started. So I feel comfortable on any golf course playing with anyone under any circumstances, which is far more than I would have ever thought. When I originally started, it was just going to be a fun thing to do. And now I've moved way beyond that. I mean, golf to me is fun. I like all the aspects of it, putting, chipping, all of it. I like all of it. I think it's all important. I don't find any part of golf to be easy to do. And I feel very, 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 very satisfied when I do well doing it. It feels like a massive accomplishment mentally and physically, as far as that's concerned. And um, uh, the mental aspect of it, just like anything else, is I think is a massively important thing. And people don't really take that seriously, but I think it's... It, 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 I walk off a golf course far more relaxed than when I walk onto it. You have to be, or it's yeah. not going to work. I think it's a really good thing to do. I think people should take it seriously and go out there and play as good as you can. You know, it's not a social event for me. Not at all. I play a really odd way. I have a really odd way of playing golf. Which is, which is um, what? Excuse me? Which is what? Like, how is it odd? Normally you carry 14 clubs. I carry nine. Mm -hmm. I have a weird way of playing in that I dumb it down on a lot of ways that people that don't, they wouldn't really teach you to do sort of akin to the way uh, Jimi Hendrix is considered the best guitar player by in a lot of, a lot of areas, but there isn't one single thing that he does guitar playing wise that any teacher would ever teach you because it's so outside the box. Interesting. If, but, but he's the best. 
you know, but no one would ever teach you to do it the way he does, which to me is insane. It's like, if he's the best, wouldn't you teach people to play the way he plays? But that they're too conservative. Golfers are too conservative. Guitar players are some of the most conservative people on the face of the planet. If you try to get them to do something left of center, you're out. You're out that's just not going to happen. Why do you think that is? I don't know. It makes no, it never made any sense to me. I never understood uh-huh. it. By and large, I never took guitar lessons. I never really took golfing lessons either. And, and so far, so good. You know. <laughs> now, there's a, a term that I looked up: uh, explosion shot in golf. I guess that's when you're stuck in a stand. Oh, explosion trap. shot, yeah. Yeah. What's what's the craziest shot you've had to take on a golf course? Oh, name it. You know, under a tree with in mud i just create the thing, weirdest things you can imagine you just do your best there's books written about that stuff you know there's what about how to get out of trouble books whole books written about how to get out of trouble <laughs> and you have to practice that to some degree and you just realize what will work mm-hmm. the best thing it's like uh is is like if you're in trouble the next shot no matter what it is should be designed to get you out of trouble doesn't mean it's going to be you know, advancing towards the green on a 300 yard shot. It doesn't mean any of that. It means get yourself out of this trouble that you're in, no matter what. That's the thing. And a lot of people don't want to look at it that way. I got to try to hit it between these trees as far forward as I can. Well, maybe, but maybe the best thing for you to do is get yourself out of this mess. It's like, if you're in a bunker, the main objective is to get it out of the bunker, no yeah. matter what, no matter how you have to do it, just get it out. It doesn't matter. So when you start thinking along those lines, you're going to have an easier time, an easier go of it. What's, what's your favorite club? Uh, golf club? Yeah. Uh, my wedge, probably. Yeah. Wedge is a sh- for short shots. That's the one I use the most, probably. I don't even, it's a pitching wedge. I use it for everything. Right. Any, any, every short shot. I only carry two wedges, which is really odd. Most people have a lot of them. One's higher loft than the other one, and uh, – but the, but but uh, I have an odd way of approaching all of that stuff too. Most of which, mm. even if people see the results, they don't believe it because it's too out outside the box for them. Same with putting and all those kinds of things. I have my own weird way of doing all that, and it's successful. It's nothing anyone would ever teach, that's for sure, because it looks odd. You know? I, I'm sensing an instructional video, the King Buzzo way. <laughs> you know, the thing is, is, is I have shown people, you know, they're like, oh, you're amazing chipping. Your chipping is amazing. Your putting is really good. And then when you show them what you do, they don't want to do it. They don't believe it. Is it like just an you odd posture don't... or is they just feel it's too much work? What's, what's their, what's their no, deal? It's, it's, it's less work. It's far <laughs> less work. Really? Like they just can't get outside this idea that the way they have to do it is the way Tiger Woods or Phil Mickelson or any of these, that's how they do it. Jack Nicholson, I remember him going It's like, what is the point of golf? It's scoring the lowest score you can. It doesn't matter how you do it. Yeah. (laughs) It's like, you want to get the ball closer to the hole so you can put it in easier. That's it. The rest of it is just, it's immaterial how you do that. So, so you break the rules of music and break the rules of golf. Do you break the rules of, photo- of photography as well? Yeah, all the time. Um, um, <laughs> photography has been a passion of mine since I was a teenager. And, mm-hmm. uh, but long before digital, because I'm 57, so digital didn't come in until, you know, really in a big way, the photography until the 90s, pretty much. Yeah, and, um, even the 2000s is when it got more sophisticated, too. It got really right. good cameras. Right, but... Uh, um, Earlier, um, I couldn't afford film and developing stuff. And I certainly wasn't going to have my own dark room or anything like that. And people don't remember that. That's what we did. I did that in film school. Yes. My dad did that as a hobby. I mean, it's a lot of work. Yeah. And I just never had to. I loved it as much as I loved it. It was just like, great. You know, I can buy a Rolleiflex camera that I can never get film developed. And I can never get, you know, never buy film for it. Never. You know, just, um, but when digital came in is really when I put all of my... Uh, the aspects of photography that I loved and really put that to good use because um, now I can take as many pictures as I want and stand there and look at it right now. You know, how's it look? How's it look? How's it look? Now I, I don't have to sit there and do a whole bunch of uh, where I used to have to take a picture of something in five different ways and five different settings to try to figure out if it was going right. to work or not. Yeah. Yeah. No more. Now I can sit there and nail that thing exactly how I want it and uh, walk away. I'm definitely a street photographer. I don't think I would do really well in a studio, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
But I did um, take the cover uh, about a year ago, take the cover of Revolver, a picture of Mike Patton. Nice. So they, they let me do that. So it kind of proved that I could do that, which is nice. That was outside, though. But um, street photography is my thing. I have an Instagram account, Real King Buzzo, um, that's solely just me showing off my photography. That's it. Uh, no pictures of me, no selfies, no pictures of me with, you know, um, uh, drunk celebrities or anything like that. It's just m- pictures that I take. That's it. You know, what are so, your favorite uh, types of pictures to take? Oh, it depends. You know, um, street photography to me is you're constantly looking for something that would take that would be a good picture. It doesn't matter what it is. Mm-hmm. I'm constantly looking for it. An angle on it that's funny or that I think is beautiful or weird, something. And I'm constantly looking for that stuff. I just can't help it constantly it doesn't matter if it's with my like regular cameras or with my phone Mm -hmm. iphones take unbelievable pictures far far beyond what people imagine because you know if you talk to i know plenty of people that are make their living taking pictures sure see me too yeah yeah you talk to them and i go well how much difference would it made for man ray if he had the equipment that they have now and they go minimally it wouldn't have mattered i mean he could take a good picture with any camera right because he's a good photographer the, the equipment matters very little. It's like, you know, Jimi Hendrix with the shittiest guitar out, out of the Ward's catalog, you know, would have still been way better than you or me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't have mattered what guitar he was playing. So you put the put put an iPhone in the hands of Man Ray or any of those people back then, they're going to take fantastically amazing pictures with it because they're fantastically amazing photographers. People get so hung up on how did you take what kind of camera did you how did you take it's the eye it's the indian not the arrow you started off with film and an old school way of working how do the two compare for you do you prefer one or the other do you like both digital hmm i prefer it like like using photoshop or are you more of somebody who just likes to take the photos and just tweak i'm not slightly? good at photoshop I'm not good at it, but it's like your dad, you know, in the dark, dark room manipulating pictures and people now have this thing. Well, I didn't use a filter. It's like photographers have always used filters. They've always used manipulation yeah, whether yeah. in the dark room or, or photo uh, uh, retouching. That's nothing new, nothing new, cropping it, editing it, all these different things that you can do. I mean, in, in yeah. the dark room, you could, you could focus in on one area of the camera of the a picture and then have that be far brighter than it. There's a million things you could do. All these things are, the things that you can do with filters, quote unquote, uh, like on an a iPad, are the same things they've been doing. In the, they're just takeoffs of what they've always done in the darkroom. Yeah, I mean, for you, so for you with photography, uh, it sounds like you're sort of a shoot from the hip kind of guy. Like you just try to find, you just try to capture things in the moment. Try to, and then, you know, there's some things where I'll go, I know there's a good picture here. I have to get it. I have to make it work. And, and um, But I'm not one to take 500 pictures and then try to pick out the best ones. I'll edit it right there. Hmm. delete 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 that's the two i want oh that's interesting so you don't keep you keep like, see, i have a huge backlog of all these photos i've taken over the years on trips you know I I like a thousand it. photos per trip and i'm like wow that's a lot of stuff but i don't want them you know i just don't want them it has to it has to speak to me or it means nothing to me so you're spontaneous but then right afterwards you're very decisive about what it is that you like absolutely or i'll take five pictures and and, and look at them later and delete four of them you know those don't speak to me. Art, art is communication. That's what it is. Hmm. It doesn't communicate something. Unless you're just trying to take a picture of, you know, here's a picture of my mom and my brother together. You know, it doesn't have yeah. to be a good picture. It's just, it's enough to just look at them and be, you know, wonder, what, you know, be happy that there's a great picture of them that you can remember forever. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that at all. And I think the cameras are great for those kinds of memory things. And I do that as well. But if I'm taking a picture that I want to use, uh, it's more of an artistic level, then it has to communicate something. If it doesn't communicate anything to me, I don't want anything to do with it. Yeah. But I have a couple of pictures here, though. Um, let me see. Let me see where they are. Um, I have them here somewhere. Here they are. Um, um, what I really like. Here's one of, here's one of I don't know if you can oh, see nice. it. Right. Here's uh, one of our drummer I took in New Orleans. That's pretty good. Oh, yeah. That's in New Orleans. Looks like, he, looks like he's uh, talking to someone preparing for some sort of secret mission. He's talking on the phone. That's right. That's a good one. <laughs> um, here's one I took of Jeff Pinkus. He's smoking weed with a Betty Ford clinic shirt on. Excellent. <laughs> oh, your wry sense of humor there, Buzz. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love that. Gotta love that. Let's see. Um, uh, here's one I took of the singer from uh, uh, La Butcherette. That's a really good one. All right on. That was with an iPhone, believe it or not. 
Yeah, you know, the quality, I mean, I, I right now I have a Galaxy and I need to upgrade. I'm thinking I, even though I'm not an Apple guy, I'm going to have to probably switch over because the quality is better on iPhones. I think. A lot of it. Yeah, a lot of it. That's when I took flying over the Indian Ocean. Oh, nice. Yeah. So it's lots of stuff like that. It's just whatever, whatever happens, you know. Are there what? But, are there any images that you're time. most proud? Of? Is there something on your Instagram account now that you really that you really love that you that you're very proud of? Uh, oh, nothing, uh, nothing in particular. I mean, I suppose I could bring it up. Hold on, let me look. I'll bring it up really quick, and then see if there's something recently. I think I have about 500 pictures, but I have I only had it for a couple of years. So, uh, oh, I like this one. This one's really good. It's a picture I took at the. At, I don't know if you can see it. It's it's a picture a I took at, higher. A, at a. Uh, 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 I probably can't see it very good, but it's interesting. Yeah, picture I took of a bunch of fish. Oh, that looks like fish. Okay, it comes out. Yeah, it's black and white. Yeah, I like black and white best. It's a little, it looks like a, it feels like it's a little overexposed too, like purposely. Like it's oh, little... it has to be to blow it out like that. And then um, this was really good. I took in Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> the next so frontier for like Amazon that. to go into is that <laughs> yeah, Amazon Motel. I think it might be different than that. And then there's no, a I really know. good one here. I took, a, I took a one of our dogs. That's a good one. <laughs> oh, that's cool. You have, so fun anyway, with, you, have, you have fun with it. By the way, so what are you shooting with? Uh, I, I have uh, um, uh, uh, two Leica cameras, the cheapest ones, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. Those, but those, those are D-Lux. expensive cameras too. They're very, they're very high end. Those are posh. Probably about eight hundred bucks a piece. Yeah. You know? um, C Lux and Deluxe. Those are the ones I take the most. I didn't want anything that was um, um, big. Mm-hmm. I don't want a camera that I have to change lenses on at all. Okay. So both of them are Zoom. Um, I don't want uh, anything I can't really fit in my pocket, but I don't. I want it to be a little better quality than, or easier to use than a uh, one of the normal digital ones. You know? Yeah. And these ones, I just think that they're really great, and I use them all the time, and they're great cameras. And I don't. I don't want some gigantic camera. It always feels obtrusive to me. Yeah. I'm worried about it. I, I don't. You know, I'm not worried about going and taking a you know close up picture of a. a, a of a silverback gorilla from 900 yards away. I have no, that's not me, you know, or, yeah, yeah. or a close-up <laughs> of a pitcher from Dodger Stadium, you know, 900, you know, I just, it's not me either. You know, it's, it's like uh, anything that I can't take a picture of with this, the way that I have it, the equipment that I have, I'm not worried about. There's plenty of stuff for me to take pictures of that, uh, um, that I'm not, uh, that, that are fine with those cameras, like, like this, a big bucket of fish heads, you know. Oh, there we go. Can't bucket of fish hits. That, that stuff's the simplest stuff. You know, you can find Sounds stuff like, like a Melvin's album title too coming up. What was that? <laughs> it could be a Melvin's album title, Bucket of Fish Heads. <laughs> so it certainly could be, you know. But that kind of stuff, it, it has to speak to me. And and I'll take pictures on tour, right? Especially when I go on tour, take pictures all the time. And then the pictures you of your bandmates? Oh, tons. Do you, do you, tons, ever do it, do you ever do it live? Like just whip out the camera for the hell of it? All no, no, never. <laughs> no, I have too much other things going on when we're playing live. Um, but, uh, uh, I take pictures of those guys all the time. Tons and tons of pictures of them. It's just they're, they're good sports. Stand well, right here. Stand right here. I got a good. Well, well, I, I mean, like, do you, you put out, you put on a timer? Like Stuart Copeland did uh, a great documentary about the early, about the police, and he took a lot. I saw of, that. It was great. Like he had a camera right behind his kit, right on stage. You got like a very different perspective of the band playing live. It was great that he documented yeah. that. Actually, yeah. Have you ever tried doing no, that at all? That's not the one, uh, the Andy Summers one, or the Stuart. Copeland that's the Stuart one. Copeland one that came out a oh. year or two ago. Did you see the Andy Summers one? No, I haven't. I just interviewed him recently too for this podcast. So he's a huge photographer too. Yeah, I talked to him about his fiction writing actually. Oh, I haven't read that, that but his, yeah, his the documentary he did with or he did with is it was called uh, um, "Surviving the Police," I think. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I think and so, I his tons of stuff about him taking pictures in there, which is originally what got me interested in them because I was I was always liked their stuff yeah, yeah. a great deal, but uh, I had no idea he was a photographer, and then I found that I I got to watch this documentary, and then it's it's really good really good how he did it but i have to look i uh, that the, the, it's interesting though what kind of stuff the cameras can do i mean everybody has a camera now and there are cameras everywhere uh, but not everybody's a good photographer it's like well, this friend of mine he goes he goes i've taken the a picture of the exact same thing as you have at the exact same moment and mine's not as good it was like you shoot digital with yep. leica and then have you what were you shooting film wise uh prior to that uh oh whatever i could afford yeah. Were you like a Nikon right. or Canon? I mean, these days it's like Nikon. I had a Canon's. Nikon when I first started. I bought a really, really, I bought a Nikon that didn't have a light meter in it to start with. Oh, interesting. You know, so you really whatever. had to, you had to guess. You had to get a lot of guesswork. I didn't have a light meter. So yeah. I learned all about how to, um, 
uh, shoot into the light, shoot, you know, burn it with the light really good. Yeah, just yeah. Tons of stuff like that. Lots of bad pictures didn't come out. You don't know for a couple of weeks until you get the pictures back. Which I mean, irritates the shit out of me. And you have know? you ever done an exhibition of your photography? Or would no, you never. Like, or would you like to? Liking. It's just I would like to. Just in the last couple of years is when I finally, the first time I ever really showed anybody was just on, on Instagram like a couple of years ago. That's it. I yeah. never had a I never had a social media account before that. It's the only one I've ever had, and it was mm. solely with that. And I've gotten a good response from people. And so um, it's not band oriented, even though it's I sometimes show the band yeah. members I take pictures of, but it's not a vehicle for me to sell you know, our new show coming up or a new album. That's not, that's not what it's about. And, uh, um, which is fine. I mean, I, I think that's fine. We have a Melvin's account that that happens on. Sure. Um, but I would love to do that. I've, I've got a book that I put together, a photography book that, mm-hmm. uh, um, um, I'm just, we're just waiting to print it. You know, so who's going to put it out to be self-published. Probably the first ones will be, we'll take it from there. That's mm-hmm. cool. And by the way, so you have, you have Batman and Superman on the wall back there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a comic book fan also, or are you just a fan of their... I do like comic books. Are there any, any things that you like to collect or read? Comic I collect um, CGC graded comics. I want, to, I want to know what the deal with that is. That's, that's like a, become a big thing where comics I never thought would be worth $100 or slabbed and suddenly... How did, what, what got you into that and why, what, how do people justify it? Because it's, I mean, how much does it cost, first of all, to even get your comic graded? Well, I usually buy them already graded. Oh, okay. You know? I don't buy, I don't, I've gotten a few slabbed, but I don't have good luck with that. I'd rather just go, you know, and, and, and go, this is it, you know, 8.0, right. you know, okay, that's what it is. Now it doesn't tell you what it's worth, but it tells you what great, what condition the book's in. Oh, then you look it up. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can figure out between you and the seller, what you want to sell it, what do you, what you want to buy it for, which I like. And a lot of people will be like, well, these aren't right. Okay. If it's not right, then sell it to me as a five. <laughs> So I guess the thing for me, like I, I buy stuff, I buy it for, I buy it to read it. So I buy readable condition. A lot of times I don't go for the the very fine or near mint and stuff. So what's the appeal for you for the CGC stuff? Is it just, is it an investment? Yeah, I guess. I mean, uh, um, I like the idea of having a Stan Lee signed, you know, Hulk 181. Okay. Well that I get. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That I like. That's probably my favorite thing I have in my collection. Nice. And the idea of opening that book and reading it seems well, that's, absolutely ridiculous. So you like you like very collect very collectible. I mean, that's a one. That's a, like a, a rare thing to have something right. like that. So that's it. What other which other comics do you? Which are the CGC graded comics like? Well, I have a bunch. Um, it depends on what what I'm looking for. Um, lots of lots of you know uh, um, key issue ones. I mean, lots of them. Um, I uh, the, the best thing I got was right before Stan Lee died. Mm-hmm. A guy from CGC was at his house. And I got him to sign. If you send it to him, he would sign anything. And because CGC has to be there for it to be certified, sign, signed by. Okay. Has, they have they have to be in the presence. They won't just say if you send in, oh, this is signed by Stan Lee. They won't just if you can't prove it, then it's not. Okay. So I got like twenty five books signed by him and graded. Wow. Right before he died, one of which is X Men Two. You know, signed Damn. by him. And, <laughs> yeah so stuff like that you know it's just it's like that would that there's no more of those you know and that's it that's it for stan lee signing books and before that people were were like well it's kind of ruining the comic and go you're, you're you're out of your mind you know this well, is stan lee well it's, it's like getting oh, Babe Ruth oh. to sign it you're, you're gonna say Babe Ruth shouldn't sign a baseball card because it's gonna ruin the card oh it makes it incredibly <laughs> valuable so what what stuff do you actually like to read do you write any newer stuff uh, classic stuff um I read lots of other stuff, you know, um, I'm not super interested in new comic books. Right. Um, uh, some, I'll collect some of the newer stuff, but, uh, mostly with the comics, if I want it, it's already going to be graded. And it's something along those lines. I'm buying the graded thing itself for fun yeah. and collecting them like that, like okay. mad number one, stuff like that. Yeah. I want it slabbed you know and and or my favorite mad issue you know halloween issue with you know done by kelly free slabbed i want i want that yeah yeah i don't want to open this book it's like to me it's like do i want to touch you know king tut's 
uh, uh, mommy, no, I'm okay. Look at it. Just look at it. Uh, you know, it's like to me, these are just these are artifacts. They were sealed in time, and they will remain that way until someone cracks them open or they get you know burned up in a fire. And I, I, I uh, uh, that's what that's what attracts me to it. Uh, probably my favorite ones to read are the EC. You know, the um, Vault of Horror. You know, Tales, Tales from the, the Crypt. Crypt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My favorites. But I have all those. I have all those in uh, book form. You know. Well, also, so funny, it's funny, hardback book farm. funny, funny story is the guy that started reprinting those, I think the late seventies, early eighties, Russ Cochran was the valedictorian on my father's graduating cra- huh. class at the university of Missouri, Rolla school of mines. Nice. <laughs> he was going to go into geology and instead made a ton of money on comic books, yeah, which, is fa- which is fantastic. Actually, you know, that's great. There's one he thing, sees my favorite, probably. I, I yeah. love, I love that stuff, and I love the fact that Creep Show, yeah, the Creep Show brought that sort of back great. in movie form, and then Creep you got this, years later, you got the series on HBO, and there were, mm-hmm. a lot of the '50s horror stuff was really transgressive. I mean, that stuff was yeah, yeah. gory. There was a little bit of sexual content, some drug use, and it was a book called The Ten Cent Plague, which is all about how essentially by 1954, 55, all those comics were not banned, but the comic book industry had to create the the comics code, and they had to self censor. They had to get rid of all Mad Magazine, Mad and Panic were two of the only things that survived EC. All the crime and war and horror comics had to go. Um, had to go. And it's amazing. You know, they're totally moral. Yeah, totally all immoral. the EC comics are all moral. They have oh, a moral ending. Oh, the, oh they're like they're all, a lot of them are like oh Henry stories that are really dark yeah. and effed up. I mean, that's they are, but the, in the end, the bad guy usually gets it. Well, there you go. Well, cool. Well, thank you. Thank you. It was thank really you. fun to chat. Thanks for having me. And uh yeah, and hopefully uh, we'll chat again soon at some point. 